Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. And today, what I want to talk to you on my channel, dedicated to Norse language and myth, is some questions about the goddesses of Norse myth, and particularly some questions about Frigg and Freya, the two most mentioned goddesses, and whether in at least some traditions of Norse myth, they might have been considered one goddess at one time. Now, Norse mythology, as well as other systems of mythology around the globe, is sometimes challenged by uh, people today who insist that it embodies a sort of um, uh, patrifocal, patrilinear, uh, in other words, male-dominated perspective. And it's true that there are not many stories about the goddesses that are preserved. There's just no way around that. It's an interesting question, and still an open question, whether this is a phenomenon of how many stories were once told before the conversion to Christianity, or whether it's a problem with how many stories about goddesses were preserved uh, from before the Scandinavian countries were converted to Christianity. And I'm not sure which way uh, to go on that personally. It certainly seems true that in this very, um, uh, sometimes people say hyper-martial, I think that's a little bit wrong because it's not a professional warrior society. The, the, the Norse aren't Spartans, but it is a hyper-masculine society that definitely emphasizes male virtues and values and strengths. I think it is quite possible that, that, that this is part of the reality of this culture, that they didn't tell that many stories about goddesses. But I also think that it's quite likely that, that there's a bottleneck here too, and that those who wrote down the stories that are preserved in the 1200s, whoever wrote down the Poetic Edda, and then Snorri Sturluson writing down his Prose Edda, were more concerned with portraying stories about male gods, particularly because the patrons of poets were male gods, Odin, and to a much more minor, minor degree, uh, perhaps Bragi. And so I think that even the degree to which our written sources emphasize the role of Odin above, say, Thor, is probably an issue of preservation rather than an issue of what was originally told, and possibly something like that is going on with goddesses as well. So let's begin by looking at some, some issues with the data set that we're, that we're working with. Again, we can't anticipate a sequel, as it were, to the Eddas. We've got the Poetic Edda, this anonymous compilation of poems. We have the Prose Edda, Snorri Sturluson's perspective on those poems, more or less. We really can't sit around and wait for a, um, uh, a new Edda, right, you know, the Edda 3 to come out or something like that. People always want that. People always want more detail on gods and goddesses that are only vaguely mentioned in the Eddas. But we're really just working with what we've got. And what we've got hasn't changed a whole lot in the whole history of modern scholarship since the, the 19th. Uh, the 19th century. Um, I often compare the Eddas to a shipwreck, and I don't mean that in the sense that my life is a shipwreck, but I mean that what you've got is these, these two books, essentially, which are the wrecked remnants of a ship that once sailed, right? We have pieces here and there of this ship, which was once a living religion. Um, we don't have the entire ship, Right? Some of it's rotten away, some of it was probably destroyed when whatever caused it to wreck, wrecked it. Uh, some of it um, has, has just been pulverized over the course of time by, by the waves of time, if you will. Um, and so we're trying to reconstruct the ship, but the particular ship that we've got that we're trying to reconstruct based on the Eddas is really late Icelandic belief because we can tell that things were different in Sweden, Denmark, and Norway. You know, there were a lot of local variations. There was variation over time. Norse myth appears to have changed significantly uh, from the earliest sources we can trace to the latest sources we can trace. And of course, there would be even bigger differences if you're talking about related Germanic people's myths uh, in England, Germany, among the Goths, etc. So it's all very challenging. And uh, our clearest picture, again, is probably that of the latest belief, the beliefs of the latest pagans in Iceland. Now that being said, looking at the Eddas, we do have poems where these goddesses Frigg and Freya are pretty clearly different. Uh, for example, in the fairly late poem Odrunargrotur, in the Poetic Edda, we see 
a, uh, a, a request. May all the goddesses, Freya and Frigg and all the others, help you, Oldrun, since you have saved me from death and childbirth. Well, this is a kind wish, but this poem probably dates from the 1100s after the conversion, as some other poems in the Poetiketa no doubt do, mostly in the heroic tradition, although some of the heroic poems are also some of the oldest. But then in Lokasena, one of the most important poems in the Poetiketa, the poem in which Loki insults all the different gods and goddesses, Freya and Frigg are clearly different individuals. Uh, Freya speaks and uh, Frigg speaks uh, and, and they have different, uh, different attributes, they have different things that they say to Loki, they mention each other when they're talking to Loki. So clearly in the 900s in, I would say, either Norway or Iceland uh, would be where uh, Lokasena was originally orally composed. Of course, none of these poems were probably originally written down. Um, that comes many centuries later. That Freya and Frigg were understood as different goddesses. And I do think that that is a majority position for late uh, uh, Norse paganism in Norway and Iceland. Well, let's consider their names. Frigg would come from a Proto-Germanic ancestor word that would be something like Frio. Now, there is a regular sound change that happens in Old Norse where two J's become two G's. And uh, this final vowel is just going to drop in Old Norse. So in fact, Frigg is exactly what we expect to come from Old uh, Proto-Germanic Frio in Old Norse. Um, even though you might look at this and see something that looks a little bit more like Freya to you at first glance. Her name in Old English was Freya, in Old Saxon, Free, and in Old High German, Freya. Notice how much that, again, looks more like Freya to us than Frigg, but this is regularly derived from the same Proto-Germanic word. This probably comes from an old root that means love. This is seen in the English word friend, which is a uh, fossil formant in English that just means the loving one, uh, opposite to the fiend, who is the hating one, hate uh, being related to the curse fi, fi on you. Um, you also see uh, this in uh, the, the Sanskrit word uh, priya, meaning beloved. So, and there is a, actually, by the way, in Old Norse, there's a verb that you see in Havamal that is derived from the same root that's frio, meaning to love. Uh, you see that in I think two stanzas of Havamal, if I'm remembering that correctly off the top of my head. So her name, potentially quite old, it is traceable to an Indo-European root meaning love that we see in and outside Germanic in words meaning love. Freya's name does not appear to really originally be a name. Much like her brother Freuer or the famous uh, uh, world-encircling monster serpent, um, the, the Midgard Ormer, Midgard Serpent, or Jormungandr, Big Monster, um, they have names that seem to have originally been titles. So, Freya would come from Proto-Germanic Frauyo. This is the same word that becomes modern German Frau, meaning woman or Mrs. Uh, so, originally this just means lady, probably, uh, rather than uh, being someone's specific name. And then her brother's name, Freuer, is simply the masculine version of that same thing. So their names mean Lord and Lady, and probably don't reflect their original names. Now I've talked before in another video, I'll link in a card, about how I don't think that it's very useful to talk about the Norse gods as God of or Goddess of, but if you were going to say that there was a Norse Goddess of Love, I think Freya would be the one that you would pick. And so it's curious to wonder whether Frigg might originally have been a love goddesses, if you will, name, and Freya her title, and then eventually this split into two different goddesses. But all that we have to go by for that is that uh, there's, there's some other evidence, which I'll get to here in a moment, that they might once have been the same, and also the fact that Freya's name does not appear to be very old as her name per se. You don't see Freuer and Freuer, those names, in place names outside of Scandinavia, or if you do, there's very few, few enough that I haven't noticed them. Uh, that suggests that these are Scandinavian names for a god and a goddess who are known by other names elsewhere in the Germanic-speaking world. Uh, Freuer, of course, uh, is easily linked to the name Yngvi. That's the Old Norse form, but there's related forms in Old English, Old Saxon. Um, that seems to be his old original name. 
I wonder if Freig is Freud's original name, but that does not mean that I think that in um, the cultural milieu in which the Eddic poems were composed, that people still thought they were the same. Now let me talk a little bit more about some of the uh, facts that have made us think, made me think certainly, and some other scholars, that Freud and Freud could originally have been considered one goddess. And I hope that as I go through some of this, that it will help you appreciate, if you haven't before, just how much of a shipwreck <laughs> our sources are. You know, you tell people you're a specialist in Old Norse who teach in a university in this stuff, or that you have any kind of specialty in the ancient or medieval past, and I think the picture they often get is sort of that you're Indiana Jones, right? Um, and I'm sure I would enjoy uh, having crazy romantic adventures all the time, whipping bad guys, swinging by a whip, you know, shooting Nazis and communists, fighting them for, you know, treasure chests full of, of uh, lost Icelandic manuscripts. But that's just not what happens, you know. We mostly sit around in our offices, or if you're lucky like me, you get to live, uh, you know, in the Rockies. Um, you still have to spend a lot of time in the office looking at just the same old documents people have been looking at for hundreds of years. Anyway, so here is a fact that, that is, has made people wonder, and that is the husband's of these two goddesses. Frigg is married to Odin. That's not really in question. Um, most uh, poems in which she occurs explicitly call her Kolna Odins, or something equivalent to that, wife of Odin. But who is Freya married to? He is said to be named Odr, and that name is, is nothing if not Odin. I will eat my hat, and this is one of my nicest hats if anyone can ever convince me that Othar and Othar aren't the same person. The god Othan, which this video is not about, but let me remind you, travels under so many different names. And Othan is formed from an adjective, Othar, which means mad. Othan simply means the mad one. Same ambiguity as in, as in English, crazy and angry. So I do not believe that this Othar could be anyone but Othan. And listen to the description that Snorri gives us in his prose edda. I'll read this for you in Old Norse and in, in English in my, uh, from my upcoming translation of the Prosetta. Freya er tignust med frig. Hon giftisk theim mani er odr heitir. Odr for i braut langar levir. En Freya krötter eftir. En tor hennar er gul raut. Freya o morg noven. And so er sok til thess, at hon gav ser ymis heiti, er hon for med okonum thiodum at leita oaths. Freya is noblest alongside Frigg. This is from the uh, uh, beginning of Snorri's list of goddesses in his prose. She is married to a man named Othar. Othar leaves on long journeys, and Freya cries at home and her tears are pure gold. Freya has many names, and the reason for this is she gives herself many names when she travels among unknown peoples to search for Othan. Now, two things about this strike me. One is that Othan is traveling all the time under different names. It would make sense if his wife has a similar uh, pattern of, of names attributed to her. It's also funny that Snorri so blatantly misunderstands many names that clearly are just alternate names of Freya or maybe Frigg, like Eir, who he calls a separate goddess of healing, Sjöven, who he calls a separate goddess of love. The one place where we hear them discussed as separate goddesses from freaking Freya is in Snorri. You have to remember, the, the poetic edda is a primary source. Snorri is a secondary source. He's just valuable because he is a secondary source who's 800 years closer to our primary sources. So this isn't the only place Freya is called Othar's wife. Also, uh, we see that um, uh, in kinnings for Freya, she is called this, uh, including by the relatively early uh, skald Einar Skulason, who was uh, composing in the 1000s, although he was a Christian, that's still relatively early. Uh, Othar is mentioned just one time in the Codex Regius. This is in the poem Voluspal, in stanza 25 of the uh, Codex Regius Recension of Olaspa. And there we have what is probably, but not certainly, Folsois is very elusive, 
a reference to the story of the builder who made the wall around Oscar, Asgard, the realm of the gods. And in the last half of that stanza, we read this, Hwerir hevdi loft alt levi blandit, eda at jotuns, oaths moi gevna. Who had blended all the air with deception, or given Other's girl to the family of a giant, or the giant's family as just a general way of talking about the Jotnar. So this is probably a reference to Freya as wife of Other. Um, again, probably just an alternate form of the name Odin. Uh, it's interesting she's called Oth's boy, girl. I wouldn't say that's a normal way to talk about wives in Old Norse. Uh, maybe girlfriend, maybe sister, maybe daughter. Sister, not very often, more like girlfriend or daughter. But um, still, it's probably a reference to Freya. And uh, it's interesting just because that's the only time that name Other even comes up. Uh, his name does come up in one other Eric poem, although not one that's in the Codex Regius. This is in Voluspal and Skama, which is in the manuscript of Flatoirbo. In stanza 47 of that poem, the Volva says to Freya, Rant at Odi, oi Froyandi. You ran after Other always lusting. So that doesn't tell us much. But however old that poem is, and I'd say that's pretty uncertain, uh, we see this association with um, Other again. Um, probably just another variant of Odin, but it's interesting that that name only seems to be associated with his role as the wife of, as the wife of, as the husband of Freya. Not sure what to make of that. Um, it is possible for a name or a variant of a name to get particularly associated with a particular body of stories or with particular uh, other names. Uh, that seems to be what's happened here. Uh, but one wonders what the mechanism is exactly for how that, that arose. Um, another bit of evidence I would use to argue that Freya can be identified as Odin's wife is actually the stanza Grimness Mall 14, which is probably the stanza that I end up um, <laughs> highlighting my disagreement about with people the most on this channel. In this stanza, we read that Freya rules, or rather she, she rules the choices of seats in the hall at a place called Folkvanger Army Plain. This is very likely to be Valhold, and she chooses half the dead who die in battle every day, and Odin owns half. Okay, that's a very literal translation of the Old Norse you see there. This has always suggested to me that Folkvanger either is Valhol, or it is just a hall that Freya happens to rule. I do not think she's taking the dead somewhere different than Valhol because that's not what this says. It says she chooses half the dead who die in battle. It doesn't say she takes them to Folkvanger, which is separate from Valhol. But on the chance that Folkvanger is the same thing as Valhol, it would make sense that Freya, as Odin's wife, would be the one who arranges or chooses the seats there, because that's what a hostess does. And of course, the, the, the wife of the house is the one who's going to be doing the hosting. I've talked a little bit more about this in some more detail recently. Uh, I did a video on Valkyries where I discussed some of the evidence that I think is pretty strong that Freya was actually considered one of, if not the chief Valkyrie, perhaps going under the name um, uh, Gondol in that role. So we have a clear idea that Frigg is the wife of Odin. Freya is the wife of Other, who's probably Odin. But then it's interesting that Freya's actual descent and family relationships are clearer than Frigg's. Freya is the sister of Freyr. Uh, they are both the children of Njorther and his unnamed sister, possibly named Njorther, if Tacitus in, you know, 900 years before these poems are composed, uh, if, if his Nerthus uh, really is equivalent to just a, a female form of, of Njorther. But at any rate, we know where she's from. Frigg we actually don't know about. Um, Frigg is called Fjorgen's girl in uh, Lokasena. We don't know who Fjorgen is. Uh, some have suggested it's an old name for Thor, but that doesn't clear this up. Uh, we just don't have a family tree for Frigg. And so that's 
that's curious and interesting and it suggests again that if these two goddesses were understood to be one at one time maybe what's happened is we've got her family tree complete in Freya we've got her who she's married to most clearly in Frigg and so the details of, of what might once have been one individual have been split into the these sort of incomplete traditions or incompletely developed traditions or incompletely preserved traditions about Freya versus Frigg. We also see inconsistency about which one is which as far as certain attributes go. For example, there's the famous falcon suit or feather skin that uh, Loki borrows fairly frequently in uh, Norse myth to fly to Jotunheimr or somewhere else on various different errands. In Thrymskvida, in the poetic Edda, this is called Froyas. But then Snorri, writing in the uh, Skald Skapramol in his prose Edda, says that it was Freya who loaned him this to fly off uh, searching for Idun. But then when he's spying on Gerdr, that he is flying in Frigg's falcon suit. And we also read in uh, Skold Skapramol that one of the many kinnings for Frigg is queen of the falcon suit. So there's inconsistency about who exactly owns this. Now, that could be because the uh, uh, because there was simply inconsistency about who owned it. I mean, I, I don't think that's too difficult to believe, especially since their names are slightly similar no matter what you do. They're both FR names, Freya Frigg. But, uh, you know, I think it's also quite possible that what's happened here is we have, again, an attribute of this originally unified goddess that's been split into two, but inconsistently uh, uh, maintain the attributes of each, which one is, which one gets those old attributes is inconsistent. Also consider the uh, name of the day Friday in the Germanic languages. Now, the either an early Germanic language speaker who encountered people speaking Latin quite early on decided on equivalence among the Germanic gods of the Roman gods whose names are in the day of the week, days of the week, or perhaps an early Roman decided on these equivalents. We don't know who decided them, but they're pretty consistent between the different Germanic languages. So for instance, Tuesday, that goes back to Old English Tewis Day, which is Old Norse Tisdagr, which is Day of Tyr. And then we have Odinsdagr is Wednesday, Thorstag or is Thursday, but then Friday is an interesting question. Now, let me explain why. In Latin, that is Veneris dies. And of course, we still see that preserved in the names of uh, this day in the Romance languages descended from Latin, Spanish, Viernes, French, Vendredi, or something like that. Uh -huh, I don't know, I don't speak French. Uh, <laughs> I just cite it. Um, but in Old English, you see this is Fria day, clearly Frigg's day. Also fairly clearly Frigg's day in Old Frisian, Frien day, and in Old High German, Friatak. And Faroese, Frigjadagr, points to what we would expect from that in Old Norse, which would be Frigjadagr, that would be day of Frigg. But the only attested Old Norse word for this name is Friodagr, which either is just straight up love day, it's kind of interesting, rather than the name of a goddess of love, it's simply love day, or could be a borrowing from English or German. The day is never called Freudagr, or the equivalent day of Freya in any of the other old Germanic languages. So that is Frigg's day. Frigg is selected as the equivalent of Venus, goddess of love, which you would not expect from the way that Frigg is described in the Eddas, where instead, uh, the goddess who is described as more of that traditional goddess of love, you know, who's craved by all the enemies of the gods and, and who has her various sexual liaisons with all the gods and elves, according to Locusena, and dwarves, according to Sorla Filfer, uh, that goddess is Freya. So to make a long story short, what I think we've got here is quite potentially uh, one goddess at one time, who was perhaps even known as something like Frigg Freya, uh, Lady Love, Lady Frigg. Um, but over time, that the use of different names for her in different contexts, sometimes just calling her Frigg, sometimes just calling her by her title Freya, 
perhaps always in association with um, another variation on her husband's name, Other instead of Odin, gradually led to the understanding of these as two separate goddesses. And that probably this had persisted for several hundred years. I don't think that um, uh, I don't I don't think that this is a recent development in say the 900s when a lot of the poems in the Poetic Edda are being composed. Um, but I do think that it's a fairly plausible scenario that once upon a time these were understood as one goddess and that later she split into two. Well, I hope this has been a somewhat informative or at least interesting look at this question. I hope that if uh, you have had questions about this goddess or these goddesses that uh, this has helped answer some of your questions or perhaps um, piqued your curiosity and I hope you'll check out some of the more than 280 other videos about Norse language myth, culture, sagas, etc. that I have set up on this channel. I have also translated the Poetic Edda into a readable contemporary modern English. Uh, that is available also in an audiobook narrated by me, as is my translation of the Saga of the Volsungs, which includes also the Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok. My next translation projects coming along are the Saga of Herborn Heidrek with the Saga of Rolf Kraki, as well as my translation of the Prose Edda, though that probably won't be available till 2021-2022. These things move slow, especially with many other obligations. If you enjoy these videos made for free in beautiful places in my Rocky Mountain homeland of Colorado and Wyoming, I hope you'll also consider becoming a Patreon supporter. And for now, I hope you'll enjoy a musical interlude with a little bit uh, more of this gorgeous mountain backdrop behind me. And I will wish you, from beautiful Colorado, all the best. Mm -hmm.